Hello, historical geology students. This is the first video of April, the week of April the 5th, and obviously you're going to take a test on Monday. We got a lab on Wednesday, which is due at 7 p.m. Um, all of the stuff that I'm going to cover today is going to be on the final exam, and I'm going to do chapter 12 right now. Paleozoic life history invertebrates. And invertebrates are different than vertebrates, obviously. Vertebra we're vertebrates. We have bones in us. And vertebrates have bones. Invertebrates do not have bones. Instead, they have shells. And we've been looking at all kinds of invertebrates in lab. Phylum Cynidria, corals, phylum mollusca, we got class gastropoda, class, uh, class cephalopoda, class crinoidea, class blastoidea, etc. We, we talked about the trilobites, brachiopods, bivalves, many different types of invertebrates. Um, Paleozoic life history, when you hear the word Paleozoic, Without delay, you should know when that, what time, what era of time that is. And there are, we're in the final eon of geologic time called the Phanerozoic Eon, which goes from 542 million years ago till now. So we're living at the moment in the Phanerozoic Eon. Phanerozoic Eon is broken down into three eras. First is the Paleozoic era, and that's the era we're now covering, going from 5, 542 million years ago till 245 million years ago. 245 million years ago, of course, Pangaea came together, and that was the start of the new era called Mes the Mesozoic era, which goes from 245 million years ago to 65 million years ago. Mesozoic era is often called the age of the dinosaurs. Last year we're going to cover is called the Cenozoic era. And it goes from 65 million years ago till now. So what era are we living in? We're living in the Cenozoic era. Otherwise, no, the Cenozoic era is called the age of the mammals. After the dinosaurs disappeared, the mammals took over the earth. So this is, here's the three eras we have of the Phanerozoic Eon. And we're starting to talk about invertebrate life from 542 million years ago to 245 million years ago. All of the periods of the Paleozoic, you should know them by now. First the Cambrian, then the Ordovician, then the Silurian, then the Devonian, then the Mississippian, then the Pennsylvanian, and the last period when Pangaea came together at the end was the Permian period. First thing we want to talk a little bit about is the Burgess Shale. B-U-R-G-E-S-S -S Shale. And the Burgess Shale is, um, is very, very interesting to geologists. And uh, the Burgess Shale is found in rocks in British Columbia, Canada by Dr. Walcott in the early part of the 20th century. He and his wife were on vacation when they found these fossils from the Mid-Cambrian. And why? what is the importance of the Burgess Shale? Well, you right, might recall that prior to, uh, in the previous eon, um, which is called the Proterozoic, we did have the Ediacaran fauna, which is the most advanced life forms that had been found up to that point period up to that point in time but by 500 by by the early paleozoic era more complicated life forms started to appear here's what here's what some of them look like this creature is called anomaloceros anomaloceros and it's eating this creature here called opabinia these soft-bodied creatures are preserved in the Burgess Shale. Think about the significance of that. We already mentioned the fact that when organisms die, 
Usually the hard body parts are all that get, are, are all that gets preserved. But in the Burgess Shale, we have actual soft body parts preserved. How can that be? Well, here you can see some of the Burgess Shale fossils. Some of the creatures in here. Some of them are familiar to you, like the trilobites, which belongs to phylum arthropoda. But other strange looking creatures like this. When Dr. Walcott and his wife saw this creature, they were amazed. Why? Because they, this creature had 13 spikes on its back and 13 legs. Here's its head over here. Uh, it was benthic. It lived on the bottom of the ocean. This is a life form that obviously no longer exists. Mother Nature tries many different body forms and those that don't work out in the battle for survival lead to the extinction of species. Here you can see Opabinia is quite odd to our modern eyes. It has five eyes. Most creatures nowadays have two eyes because binocular vision is what works. And, it, and, and, and nature tries other, other uh, body forms, such as five-eyed creatures, that didn't work as well. It wasn't necessary. Perhaps too much of the, um, the metabolism of this organism, energy was used to maintain five eyes. It wasn't worth it in the battle for survival. It had one arm that came out the front of its body that it would use to grasp things and to eat. But in this case, this Opabinia became the prey to Anomalocerus. So how did these soft-bodied creatures like this creature here with 13 legs and 13 um, spines on its back, it's called Hallucigenia, because when Dr. Walcott and his wife saw this, they thought they must be hallucinating. They couldn't imagine a creature like this. How did um, Opabinia, Anomalocerus, and hallucigenia and, and all these strange life forms and some other life forms that are familiar to us like trilobites how did the soft body tissue get preserved we think that it occurred from an avalanche a landslide that buried these creatures so if creatures are rapidly buried like that sometimes the soft body tissue can be preserved if all of the oxygen gets pushed out of the sediment during the landslide because what causes a corpse to decay is scavengers feeding on the body, um, water currents tearing apart the body, um, bacteria uh, eating into the flesh, sc scavengers picking on the remains. Well, if these organisms in the Burgess Shale were rapidly buried by mud because uh, and clay, that's what shale was, then it could have squeezed out all that oxygen so that there was no way for bacteria to survive and feed on the corpses. There was no way for scavengers to get at these organisms, and so the soft body tissue actually got preserved. That's the significance of the Burgess Shale. Burgess Shale, from the first period of the Paleozoic, the Cambrian. Or soft body to it get it really what think about it not, pretend like you're not just taking this class what is the significance of this well it's quite profound because when we look at the fossil record we only get to see the hard body parts and on those rare occasions where we get to see the soft body tissue we get to see what the biological world was really like 70% of organisms don't have hard body parts. We get to see what the whole biological world looked like, not a biased view just based on the, the higher preservability of hard body parts. At the beginning of the Cambrian, again, we're the first period of the Paleozoic still, we see organisms start to develop shells. This did not exist in the previous eon, during the Proterozoic. So the development of these shells at the very beginning of the Cambrian was a huge advance for the invertebrates. And you might ask yourself, 
knowing what you know about evolution, what's the advantage of having a shell? Well, think about it like this. What advantage do snails have over slugs? What's the advantage of a snail having a shell? Well, there's three main advantages to having a shell. The first is protection. It's a lot harder to eat a snail than a slug. If you try and attack a, a snail, the shell could protect the organism. It also makes it harder for anybody who wants to crush that shell and digest all those sharp shell fragments. So it's, protection is one of the reasons, one of the advantages of having a shell. The other advantage is it keeps the organism moist. So when conditions become dry, that snail is a lot less likely to dry up than a slug is. Third advantage having a shell gives to the organism is it gives a surface upon which that soft organism can attach to. And if it could do that, then it could start to develop larger organs. So at the beginning of the Paleozoic, during the first period, the Cambrian, we have both the Burgess shale and we have the development of tiny little shells. This is called the Shelly fauna, and this occurred at the very beginning of the Cambrian. And um, what this would lead to is something that every geologist around the world is interested in, and that is the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian, there, think about it like this. The Cambrian is the first period of the Paleozoic era, right? So the Cambrian began 542 million years ago. And prior to 542 million years ago, during the pre-Cambrian, we did not have many fossils. So if you look at <clears throat> um, Archean and Proterozoic rocks, you have to search far and wide to find any fossils. During the Archean, the fossils were microscopic, tiny, and then they started to become somewhat larger during the Proterozoic, but still, by and large, it's hard to find fossils in Proterozoic Archean rocks. In, pre, pre, in other words, in Precambrian rocks, it's fossils are rare. All of a sudden, you hit this magical spot 542 million years ago when the Phanerozoic Eon begins and the Cambrian period begins, there is an explosion of life where all modern phylum appear, both invertebrates and, and vertebrates. So imagine rocks underneath this 542 million year mark don't have any fossils. You know, there's almost no fossils in them. They're hard to find. All of a sudden you hit this, you hit the Cambrian period, the first period of the Paleozoic and the first period of the Phanerozoic Eon. There is an explosion of life. Fossils are abundant in rocks that are younger than 542 million years. So, what caused this explosion of life to occur 542 million years ago? Well, most scientists believe that the reason why fossils all of a sudden become abundant 542 million years ago is that during the Cambrian they developed shells and for vertebrates they developed bones. So you're not really seeing an explosion of life 542 million years ago. It appears that way. What you're really seeing is an explosion in preservability Prior to 542 million years ago, when organisms didn't have shells and bones, they were soft-bodied creatures. They would rarely get preserved. They were in the Ediacaran fauna, but by and large, you don't see fossils. All of a sudden, 542 million years ago, organisms developed, invertebrates developed shells, vertebrates developed bones, and that made it much more likely for an organism to get preserved in the rock record. 
Why did shells and bones all of a sudden appear for organisms 542 million years ago? Well, it, we think it's directly related to increased oxygen, oxygen in the atmosphere. So by 542 million years ago, we no longer find BIFs, banded iron formations. The environment on our planet was an, uh, became, has already become much more oxygen rich. Remember those banded iron formations, those BIFs? They formed during the Archean and the Proterozoic. They're no longer found in, in Phanerozoic rocks because our atmosphere had become much more oxygen rich. And oxygen rich waters allow for organisms to develop shells and bones. Here's a picture that <clears throat> We need to get very, you, you should be getting comfortable with having taken several fossil labs, done several fossil labs. You got to know what the following means. Um, when we talk about lifestyles or modes of life for organisms, then we, so lifestyles, organisms can be benthic, nectonic, or planktonic or terrestrial so, so when you're looking at those fossils you always want to ask yourself did they live on the bottom of the ocean or did they burrow underneath the sea floor if that's the case they're benthic most of the fossils you saw in lab were benthic creatures or did they swim in the water if they were swimmers they're nectonic such as the cephalopods. Your swimmers are your usually on the top of the food chain. They're your hunters, your carnivores. Or what about the tiny little creatures in the ocean called plankton? One drop of seawater might hold the bodies of thousands or tens of thousands of these little plankton who build their little shells, which we call tests, so microscopic shells are called tests, and it's like a rainfall of these tests. These creatures might just live a few days or a few weeks, and they fall like a rainfall to the bottom of the sea floor. Their tests are made of calcium or calcite sometimes, and that'll make they'll end up becoming limestone, or they're made of silica, in which case they'll make chert or flint. Terrestrial organisms are organisms that live on the land, including your plants and various reptiles, amphibians and mammals and dinosaurs. So there's your lifestyles, you should know those. We haven't really, in all the fossils you looked at so far, have been benthic or nectonic or terrestrial but I'm going to start to show you some planktonic fossils soon and these are tiny these are like the, the size of um, a cyst very small maybe like a sixteenth of an inch or a thirty second of an inch and they kind of look like this sometimes these are called foramin foram these are foraminifera tests those are your planktonic organisms those are the ones that float in the water. So even though we haven't seen any planktonic fossils, you should know what they look like when we start to look at them. Here's some other ones. Some of them are quite beautiful. This is the dominant life form on planet Earth. There are more of these than anything else on the planet. And here's their test. The little animal lives inside these tests. And when the animal dies, it floats to the bottom of the sea floor. Most of the tests are made of calcite. So some of these tests will end up making limestones. And some of the tests are made of silica, and those will make chert or flint. So how are you going to tell if an organism is a planktonic organism? organism? Well, there's, they have a geometric shape to them. 
Um, you can look them up on the internet. And they're always small. They're always really small. Uh, l smaller than a pea. Much smaller than a pea. Here's your major phylum for the invertebrates. And it's important to remember that all of these phylum, all of these phylum appeared at the, during the Cambrian. Cambrian period, all major invertebrate and vertebrate phylum, which we'll take a look at in the next chapter, appeared during the Paleozoic. We already showed you phylum Proterozoa. Those are those microscopic planktonic creatures. Phylum Periphera. Those are your sponges. We showed you that earlier on. Phylum Archaeocyatha. We'll take a look at that. Phylum Synidria. Corals. Phylum Bryozoa. Those twig-like benthic organisms. Phylum Brachiopoda. Brachiopods. We showed you those. Phylum Mollusca. Class Glass Gastropoda. Class bivalvia, class cephalopoda, we looked at that. Phylum annelida is worms. Do you think we have a good record, fossil record of phylum annelida? Yes or no? I'll teach you a word in French. No. Why? Well, worms don't have hard body parts, so they're not easily preserved in the rock record. Phylum arthropoda includes class trilobota. If you find a trilobite in a rock, Please don't forget, it must be Paleozoic in age because they died out 245 million years ago. If you find a trilobite in a rock, that tells you that rock must have formed during the Paleozoic era because trilobites only existed during the Paleozoic era. Crustaceans are things like crawdads and lobsters and crabs and um, shrimp. Those are all belong to phylum arthropoda and class crustacea. Insects belong to phylum arthropoda. And then we talked about the echinoderms with their fivefold symmetry the blastoidea, crinoidea, echinoidea, asteroidea. We've talked about that in the previous video. You can go look that up again. Hemigordata, we talked about graptolites and what they look like. So you should know what each of these fossils look like. And you, you can do that through all the labs that you've been doing and all the videos that I had given to you earlier on so I'm not going to cover it again but you should know these for the test so there might be pictures on the next test of some of these organisms you need to know that belongs to phylum echinodermata it's got five-fold symmetry that belongs to phylum periphera that looks like a sponge and it's benthic and you should know those fossil groups for the next test let's talk a little bit about Step by step, we're going to talk about invertebrate life history, and we'll begin with the first period of the Paleozoic, the Cambrian period. This is an artist's depiction of what the sea floor, the ocean sea floor, might have looked like during the Cambrian period. All of a sudden, there is lots of life that is preserved in the rock record, with shells and bo and and bones too, but. We're focusing on the invertebrates here. Lots of trilobites everywhere. Trilobites were everywhere during the Cambrian. These benthic creatures, you've seen what they look like. They're ubiquitous. They were everywhere, covering the bottom of the seafloor. We have sponges. We have crinoids. We have bryozoa. Just to remind you what bryozoa looks like, I showed you earlier, but I'm going to remind you again. Shows you different bri. They kind of twig like. They're twig like, or they're corkscrew like, or they're like Rice Krispies. They're usually less than an inch long, and they're benthic organisms. They they filtered the water, and that's how they ate. Phylum Bryozoa looks like this. They showed up too, during the Cambrian period, but trilobites were everywhere. What period comes after the Cambrian? You got to know this. What comes after the Cambrian is the Ordovician, right? So we're going to look at the Ordovician in a moment. These are, uh, but before we go into the Ordovician, let's finish the Cambrian. Here's some strange-looking trilobites, and you can see that 
their bodies are much different looking. The early trilobites, there's their eyes, there's the middle part, and there's the back end called the pygidium. These are phylum arthropoda class trilobota. These strange looking creatures are called archaeocyathids. And the full grown uh, male or, uh, would grow up to six to eight feet long. And notice it has all these legs that it used to grab onto the bottom of the sea floor. Notice it also has lots of holes in it. It filtered out the water. It's an animal, it's not a plant. The archaeocyathids. Phylum Archaeocyathid. Uh, we don't have any to show you it, um, because they're quite large and expensive. But th this is what they look like. They have a central chamber and they have all these little holes around here on the top. And there's the, its legs and the whole pores so it could filter the water. These built the reefs of the Cambrian. So the, during the Cambrian period, Archaeocyathids built reefs. The, the, the reefs were not coral reefs back during the Cambrian. They were archaeocyathid reefs. And archaeocyathids, belonging once again to phylum archaeocytha, only lived during the Cambrian period. So archaeocyathids are excellent index fossils. If you find archaeocyathids in rocks, you know that rock was formed five uh, uh, during the Cambrian period, the first period of the Paleozoic era. Again, the Burgess Shales, Cambrian too. Don't forget that small shelly fauna. Here's another soft-bodied organism preserved in the Burgess Shale. This is an arthropod. But this one here is probably a, uh, it's not a trilobite, it, so it could be a crustacea, class crustacea. So what period comes after the Cambrian? The Ordovician. Now let's see how the seafloor has changed. What's different here during the Ordovician compared to the previous image we saw of the Cambrian? Here's the Cambrian seafloor. Now let's take a look at the Ordovician seafloor. What's different? Look at these huge cephalopods, Phyla mollusca, class cephalopoda. These nectonic organisms became very common during the Ordovician. And that's why you see less trilobites, because the trilobites were feasted upon by the cephalopods. And so you still have trilobites during the Ordovician, they just weren't as abundant due to this new predator coming onto the scene, the cephalopods. Another thing you want to remember about the Ordovician period is that there's no more archaeocyathids. Instead, the reefs of the Ordovician are formed by bryozoa. These phylum bryozoa that we talked about earlier on. So Ordovician reefs are not archaeocyathid reefs, they're bryozoa reefs. After the Ordovician, phylum synidria would dominate the reefs. Coral reefs are, uh, uh, dominate reefs from the Silurian all the way on to today. But back during the Ordovician, the bryozoans made up the reefs. We do see corals show up during the Ordovician, and they do build up some of the reefs. Bryzoans are the main reef builders, though. And here's one you've seen before. Here's another one. Phylum what? What, what do corals belong to? Phylum synidria, right? Brachiopods. You've seen lots of brachiopods. I've, I've sent you a video so you can determine that they have two shells, but they, they're different looking than the uh, bivalves because they have this little beak on the end and the two shells are usually uh, mirror images of one another. 
And also brachiopods tend to be smaller, usually not longer than an inch. Phylum Brachiopoda. Brachiopods become much more common, but when you look at rocks in Tennessee, you find lots of brachiopods. Why? Because brachiopods are very, very, very common, much more than bivalves during the Paleozoic. 245 million years ago, Pangaea came together, the Paleozoic era ended, the Mesozoic era began, and from the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic to the present day, the bivalves have by and large replaced brachiopods. You've never heard of brachiopods before you took this class. You can't go to Red Lobster and order brachiopods with lemon and butter. It's, they're rare. But back during the Paleozoic, they were quite common. Here's another type of fossil. And these were quite common during the Ordovician. These are called graptolites. These, they have these sawtooth-like blades in them. And we talked about that in an earlier video. These are planktonic organisms. They floated. There were, it was like a jelly-like fi jellyfish-like creature with these saw blade things in it. Phallum hemichordata, class Graptolinea. It's up here. So you, always, you can always go back here if you forget. And go back to uh, and look at the pictures and see if you can uh, classify the fossils. These graptolites were quite common during the Ordovician as well. Conodonts were also quite common. What happened is at the at the end of the Ordovician, there was a global cooling, and there are five mass extinctions that we're going to study and in, our, in geologic history. And the first is the end of the Ordovician. Then the second one is the end of the Devonian. The third is the end of the Permian, which is the biggest mass extinction in Earth history. And the fourth is at the end of the Triassic period in the Mesozoic. And the fifth is at 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs became extinct. But the first mass extinction occurred at the end of the Ordovician when the geologic evidence indicates that the Earth became much colder, wiping out many brachiopods and bryozoans. See here, 50% of brachiopods and bryozoans became extinct in the North America area. And what that would lead to is that after the Ordovician period, in other words, starting with the Silurian period, reefs would no longer be dominated by Bryozoa. Archaeocythes, they became extinct during the Cambrian. But by, after the Ordovician, during Silurian and Devonian time, reefs are dominated by corals, phylum synidria. During the Silurian and Devonian periods, ladies and gentlemen, during the Silurian and Devonian periods, the oceans were dominated by reefs, phylum synidria reefs, coral reefs. That tells you something right away, doesn't it? It tells you that during the Silurian and Devonian period, most of the planet was covered by warm, shallow, clear, sunlit, tropical seas like the Bahamas or Bermuda. Here you can see that coral reefs were very common throughout the Silurian and Devonian, much more common than today. Most of the world, all around the world, we had coral reefs, phylum synidria. At the end of the Devonian, we would have another mass extinction due to global cooling that would wipe out most of the reefs. So the, the coral reefs had their heyday during the Silurian and Devonian periods. During the Silurian, we also had these strange creatures. These are called Eurypterids. 
Look at these Eurypterids. Let's take a look at them. These are arthropods. They belong to phylum Arthropoda. They look like this. You can tell. You can see the pincer-like arms some of them have. Some of them were quite large. Look, look how big they were compared to a, a six-foot-tall human, six-foot-tall man. These are very large creatures. They were the hunters. They were the nectonic hunters going through the reefs. And they thrived during the Silurian and Devonian when the earth was covered by warm, shallow, tropical, sunlit, clear seas. At the end of the Devonian, these became extinct. So these only were here because they had lots of food to eat in these coral reefs during the Silurian and Devonian period. At the end of the Devonian, we had our second mass extinction. The first mass extinction was at the end of the Ordovician due to global cooling. The second one is at the end of the Devonian, which wiped out most of your reef communities and wiped out your Eurypterids. After the Devonian, we get into the Mississippian period, and we can see that lots of crinoids, look at all these crinoids, they, they still exist today. A lot of people don't know these are animals, they're not plants. Here's their neck, and here's their calyx, their head, and it's got five legs to hold onto the bottom of the sea floor. These are echinoderms, class crinoid fossils. We've looked at these. These are very common in the Silurian and the Devonian. They look like th this. These are their necks, the stems. This is its head. The head is called a calyx. And I, I really want to find some calyxes. I haven't found too many. And but you can see you can buy them on eBay too. There's the crinoid stems. Here's some more crinoid stems. See the five-fold symmetry? Here's some calyxes. Phylum Echinodermata class crinoidea. Benthic organisms. Quite common during the Mississippian and during the Pennsylvanian as well. When you get to the per Permian period, trilobites are a lot rarer because they've been a lot of things feeding uh, or hunting them, including the cephalopods and fish too which we'll talk about in the next chapter, which is about vertebrates. But here you can see sponges. Uh, you see some coral reefs still, like we had in West Texas, the Permian Reef deposits. And at the end of the Permian, ladies and gentlemen, is the largest mass extinction in Earth history, called the Permian Extinction. So the first mass ex extinction here occurred at the end of the Ordovician. The second one occurred at the end of the Devonian, wiping out most of the reef communities. But the third mass extinction, even bigger than the dinosaur extinction, occurred 245 million years ago at the end of the Permian, which is also the end of the Paleozoic and the beginning of the Mesozoic era. So this extinction was bigger than the dinosaur extinction. The largest mass extinction that has ever occurred in Earth history, the closest that we have come to a Armageddon, a lifeless planet, occurred 245 million years ago. And it's not a coincidence that 245 million years ago, that's when Pangaea came together. When Pangaea came together 245 million years ago, the Paleozoic era ended, and the Mesozoic era began. The age of the dinosaurs began. 245 million years ago, the continents came together, and life was almost wiped out on planet Earth. More than 90% of invertebrates became extinct 245 million years ago. More than 90% of the species, invertebrate species in the ocean became extinct. 
more than half of land vertebrates became extinct. Why did the coming together of Pangaea 245 million years ago result in such a biological c catastrophe? Well, the coming together of Pangaea blocked ocean currents. Without going into all the detail, because we, we do that in physical geology, I'll just tell you, the coming together of Pangaea blocked ocean currents, leading to very dry conditions on the land during the Mesozoic, where deserts grew out. That wiped out many vertebrate species, like amphibians, we'll talk about that later. But in the oceans, the reason why the coming together of Pangaea 245 million years ago wiped out so many invertebrates, including the trilobites and the blastoids, which would never make it into the Mesozoic, is that when these were separate continents, you had more continental shelf, more shallow ocean, because you had separate continents. By bringing all the continents together, you're effectively causing a 80% reduction in living room, living space, less shallow ocean with one big continent compared to many small continents. So you had overcrowding, and, th and, and overcrowding led to less food. And, to, and when things die, they fall to the bottom of the ocean, and their corpses remove oxygen from the, the seawater. And so oxygen was being sucked out of the ocean, suffocating many marine invertebrates during the greatest mass extinction ever that occurred during the Permian 245 million years ago. We'll continue on later.